Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Josh Hodges. I'm the host of Online with an Architect. Uh, very happy to have uh, Mark Gabrielski here with me today. Welcome, Mark. Josh, good to talk to you uh, on opposite sides of the world at this point. So. Absolutely. So a couple of weeks ago, we were in person at, uh, at VM Explore, uh, and now we're the opposite side of the globe. So uh, how things change so quickly. Yeah. So how's, uh, how's everything going with the end to end? Uh, I mean, you guys made some good announcements. You got a lot of uh, partnerships uh, started. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to that, too. I just talked to m uh, my COO, and we're going to start pushing through and having those discussions ourselves to get partnered with you all at yeah. the end to end. Absolutely. No, it's, it's been great. Obviously, at Explore, you know, on the Cube, we announced uh, the alliance with ComDivision. Um, great team at ComDivision uh, I've known for a long time and lots of interest. Um, I thought there might be some pushback or, or something like that, but actually all positive. So that's really nice. And yeah, lots of people like yourself have, have reached out with interest about uh, how we can serve customers better. So very exciting. Well, you know, I think one of the advantages you have there, Josh, I mean, you've been involved in the community for many years, right? Every, a lot of people do know who you are. And, you know, uh, your skill sets, your point of view, your honesty, your integrity, that matters a lot. And when we start dealing with partnerships at, at, at our level and above, uh, it's we're not worried about someone poaching clients. You know, uh, there's only so many experts in the field. And a lot of us do know each other. And uh, if you make one mistake, you're burned in this career path for a long time if you mm -hmm. if you wrong someone. So I yeah. can't even imagine that that would be a major concern going forward. I'm just excited that other people are, uh, are starting to see the value in it. Yeah, and I think your point is is valid that that the whole poaching thing happens when you don't know each other, when it's something's a commodity and and things like that. And obviously, that's not the case with our skill sets. Um, so we haven't even done your introductions yet. That you're one of the early uh, VCDXs. You're the you're the Michael Jordan VCDX number twenty three. Which who, um, Michael Jordan? Yeah, the the hockey player, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean. I think at, at our level, we, we all know each other reasonably well, um, and it, it's not a large group. There's 300 of us in the world, and you know we all obviously uh, have worked very hard to get to where we, we're at. So we don't want to compromise that over you know getting an account or getting a deal or something like that. Uh, so I think True. that long-term relationship uh, is much more important uh, than some potential short-term gain. So uh, yeah, no, it's great that we're all in alignment on that. Well, I see it going places. I think it's going to be a fun journey to be on. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, a few more announcements coming soon. So, uh, yeah, probably enough of a, pitch, uh, of a pitch about my business. Hopefully yeah. we're, we're going to learn some things from you today. Um, but yeah. so let, let's start off with, as we were talking about it at Explore, you know, we're talking obviously about end-to-end -end and, and what I'm trying to do here with, with my team. But what's the big problem in IT that, that we have that, you know, isn't in any other industry. What can you uh, enlighten us a little bit? I see it in one, one, uh, one area completely, uh, but it goes wider than that. When you hear it, it's we're, we're sick of hearing it, but it's the skills gap. And whether that's skills in data center, skills in Kubernetes, skills in you know developing modern applications, skills in you know risk management for you know data and company uh, resources. Uh, lack of skills in AI and ML and all these exciting new things that are available to us. They may, you know, just because Kubernetes is out doesn't mean you have to migrate your workloads to Kubernetes. Uh, but it's now an option that you can use if you architect something correctly. But that entire skills gap, just because, you know, that exists, there's just not enough smart people. The smart people I would hire at my company, they're happily employed somewhere else and they're paid pretty well. And they probably have a really good work life balance. And I think the fact that so many companies are focusing on the retention of those very smart people that they've hired uh, that will challenge others that are leaders, that are mentors, but they also understand how to consume technology, be it something that they've practiced for 20 years or be it something new that they're exploring uh, to benefit a customer, benefit themselves for whatever reason. Um, but I seem to, you know, that's one of the things that I see the most is so many of my customers uh, they need, I need somebody to staff a network uh, architect. I need someone to staff, uh, my, my VDI environment. Uh, my staff just left. Uh, it's so bad that we started a staffing department. 
uh, mm. at our office just because we needed to place so many people in areas where uh, there was that skills gap. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think I've seen it throughout my career. It's, it's everyone's always trying to find that expert or that SME uh, in a certain area and very hard to come by, very hard to retain. And I think certainly once you get to, you know, that, let's say a VCAP level, VMware advanced certified advanced professional or VCDX level, the opportunities really grow for those people. So like you say, keeping them happy um, is very important. And when companies do value them and, and put them first and give them the work-life balance, why would they leave? So, you know, they get to a, a comfortable position, they're paid well, the work is good. You know, it's very hard to then grow more talent. Well, I mean, I've seen some companies be short-sighted too, though, right? There's a VCDX that both of us know pretty well. Um, and I remember when they got their VCDX, they are working at a company just doing rack and stack and uh, a couple of small, you know, minor minor details, but there was no challenge to the work anymore. Hmm. And she mentioned she got her VCDX. They were like, oh, that's nice. And then they went about their day. And that that reaction from that cut from that vent that uh, that company drove this person to leave that company and find something challenging. And now they're they're very successful in, in, in what they're doing and very happy. But uh, if you're not looking in, at retaining that top level talent, I think you're missing the boat. Mm, absolutely. And I think that company probably looking back has gone, wow, we really dropped the ball on that. They've lost a huge talent um, and very hard to get that sort of level of talent back. Um, and even if you can, you're obviously going to pay a significant amount uh, for that, that skill set. So, yeah, I think to, uh, to all the employers out there who have VCDX type people, uh, you should hang on to them for dear life because uh, they're very valuable. Uh, and certainly for my company, being all VCDXs, uh, I value that skill set, you know, incredibly high, and because they deliver the outcomes, it's simple as that. I don't need to have a whole bunch of people mentoring them, looking after them. You know, we can provide very cost-effective services uh, with expert-level capabilities because we don't have all those middle management layers to have to pay for. So, yeah, I certainly see the value. I've been seeing it for years. Um, so, anyone out there with a VCDX or the the opportunity to get one of their staff to go through that journey, you should absolutely support them in that. Uh, and so that's one of the things I always take pride in doing, Josh, when we, uh, when I do go to VMworld, I'm sorry, VMware Explorer, it's, it's always <laughs> going to be VMworld, right? <laughs> Excuse me, but uh, at VMworld, uh, VMware Explorer, we do the VCDX workshop in person where, you know, you get everybody together. A lot of VCDXs just show up to provide assistance to whoever is leading the, uh, the workshop, it's been what Chris Much Muchler has been doing it for the past two, three uh, years online and in person. Uh, so you'll see the community constantly gives back. Uh, there's mentors. And if you really are serious about taking on an expert level certification, there's plenty of help for you all in today's day and age. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, back in the day when, when you did the certification, uh, you probably couldn't uh, spell the acronym. Um, when I went through it, it wasn't much better. Uh, but now, for sure, that there's a lot of resources, a lot of people willing to help. So, yeah, no excuse. Any architects out there that uh, that want to grow their career, it's it's a pretty simple and well proven plan. You know, go through that journey. It'll take as long as it takes, but uh, at the end of that, you'll certainly be in a position to elevate your career. Yeah. Plus, it's a good good learning experience, right? I mm. mean, there was so much I learned doing it. So. You brought up that I was one of the early, uh, early VCDXs, mm. and uh, <clears throat> I was lucky to get in the program. Uh, just a stroke of luck, um, but it required taking, you know, the VCAP exams. But they, you know, they didn't exist at the time, so they were beta VCAP exams. God, this was on version three of vSphere, and they were terrible. I mean, they were buggy. They didn't really actually measure the things that they were looking for. So. We help polish that, and I, that's kind of how I stayed involved in the VMware certification program too. But with the VCDX, um, when I went through their program, there's a blueprint that you can still download today that kind of talks about what you need to deliver, what kind of documentation you need, um, you know, the validation plan, what you need for operations, you know, the whole shebang. And it was what, like a 10, 20 page document, mm. irregardless of length. Uh, that was the only help I had back then. I had to try and figure out what I had to create. 
anyone going through it today, I think has it so much easier. There's just so much help, so much guidance, so much reference material on what you need to bring to the table and how you can put it all together. Um, I think right now, if, if my investment in time when I did that program was a couple of hundred hours, I think now, you know, putting that documentation together might be a hundred hours for someone, mm. the whole thing from scratch. So yeah, a hundred hours sounds like a lot, but really that's like two weeks of work. It's not that yeah, much. It's not that much, especially for the learning experience. Excuse me. And also what it gets you at the end of that, which is, you know what you don't know, and then you can get better. So that's well, what I always say to people. It's very hard to learn what you don't know. It's an unknown situation. But when you go through this program, you very quickly find out, oh, I, I don't really know how to justify that decision. I'm not quite sure how that technology works or how does that map to the business? You find that out and you go, oh, wow, I'm going to do some research. Um, so it's, it's a cheat sheet for getting better. In my well, let's, turn the let's turn the tides on you. What was the one thing that you really took away from that process, right? I mean, a lot oh, of folks I, only know you as, as the expert already, right? But you had to learn a lot of this stuff too at some point. Mm. Yeah, I mean, what I found was, you know, when I was putting together my documentation, um, which I'd done that style of documentation for a little while before uh, I submitted, but what I found was I really wanted to make my design decisions bulletproof. I wanted to make it so that that document could be handed to someone like yourself and I wouldn't have to explain it. You would go, okay, cool, I can see what Josh has done here. Yep, I either agree or not, but at least I know why Josh has done what he's done. And so I went through and was making all the justifications and the alternatives and all this stuff. And I realized, mm, I don't really know many alternatives. I know this one pretty well, and I maybe know another one, but that's it. Like, so my depth of knowledge wasn't really there. So now when I make a decision, if I haven't thought of two other alternatives, I feel like I haven't considered it you know, sufficiently well. So just going through understanding that I didn't have enough depth to you know, make sure this was the right decision and then when I document it, uh, it, it just teaches you what you don't know. So just filling out the architectural decision table that I've published on my blog many years ago um, teaches you a lot. And you don't have to have someone standing there asking you questions. You just fill it out and you very quickly get to a point where you don't know what to write. And that's what you got to learn. Yeah. Well, that's cool because, you know, that, that kind of mimics one of the things I took away as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> how to put these documents together, how to justify and actually articulate my decisions mm. as I was going through these processes, these architectures, uh, you know, uh, even, even the one that I did my design on, um, uh, a simple thing, you know, uh, back then it was just a couple of products, right? It was V center ESX and site recovery manager had just come out mm. and, uh, was doing a, a new implementation for a customer and doing a DR plan. But they said, oh, we're not doing the actual DR plan. But I had to write the documentation as though, hey, lockstep, we're designing it, we're planning for it. Even though this is implemented in phase two, which mm -hmm. might be six months later, here's all the things that we're going to do ahead of time to plan for that so you can plug that next component in. Mm -hmm. uh, learning how to forward think like that and make life easier for day two operations, not just to actually get something deployed and operational. Yeah, I mean, Chris Mutchler would love what you just said about day two because he's a big focus on day two, as am I. But most people go, okay, phase one of the project is this. That's all we're looking at. But people like Chris and yourself always go, well, hang on a minute. In phase two, we're going to implement this other product. We need to set the foundation up ready to plug that piece on top so we don't have to re-architect or redeploy or reconfigure. Um, so I think that's a key uh, point about VCDXs is – they always think about the next step and the step beyond, and they minimize the risk of re-architecting and, and rework and, you know, throwing out equipment and having to replace it prematurely and things like that. So, well, you know, and that, I think that goes to one of the topics that you harp about quite often on social media. And that's, I don't you know about anything on social media. I'm a very friendly person, I'm very passive. <laughs> oh, all right. Your Never opinions on this are very well known and I agree with them. Uh, <laughs> That if you architect a solution first, rather than buy a bunch of hardware and try to uh, shoehorn a solution to use something that you bought, which may not actually meet any of the requirements or outcomes for an organization, eh, it just feels backwards and that you will have to spend more money to accomplish the goals, or you're going to have to sacrifice on quality as you roll something out. Uh, I'd prefer never to sacrifice on the quality component, right? People will remember what you've built. And, Absolutely. Uh, 
Yeah, so I think to, to me it makes sense. I think it was John Arazid or actually it might have been Chris Mutchell as well. We just talked about you, you can't build the apartment on the 40th floor without building the other 39 floors. But in IT, we seem to try and build, you know, this feature or this capability or we sell the hardware for this without thinking about all the other levels. And it, it's crazy to me. I, I don't get it. I think if you ask me to design a solution and you've already given me all the pieces, <laughs> I've got a ton of constraints I've got to work within, right? I can't actually start where I want to start, which is at the conceptual layer with the business requirements. I've got to now start at the physical layer and work in the opposite direction and try and force things to make it fit, like the little children's toy with the uh, circles and the squares and stuff. It's kind of like that, but all the shapes don't fit. Um, that's what I, I find um, in the real world is when people sell before they architect, it always happens. And you know, I think all vendors are, are guilty of this. I don't think it's like vendor A or vendor B. It's people will sell you hardware, sell you software, and sell you services. You will pay for that, and then someone will come out like us and go, oh, geez, I wouldn't have done that. Oh, could, I wish I could change that CPU or that storage doesn't really do what you think it does, or, and then try and make it fit. And the customer goes, I've just paid all this money to this vendor who I trust, and the architect's telling me it's, it's not optimal. Whereas if they sold the services first, do an assessment, work out what they're trying to achieve, then it can be properly scoped and they can buy exactly what they need. And I just don't get why people don't do that. But Josh, then all of a sudden, <clears throat> our salespeople have to slow down their cycle. I can't get my sell in this quarter. I need to make my numbers this quarter, right? Maybe that's a motivation. Maybe the customer's got budget that they need to, to actually spend, right? So that maybe that becomes the constraint. I've seen all sorts of crazy reasons why people buy everything before they put the solution together. Mm. And you know what? I'm even okay with doing, not that it's optimal, right? I prefer to do a proper architecture and design document, capturing things and making design decisions about why I chose to do X, Y, and Z, and then offering alternatives to, to mitigate risks or uh, other approaches to solving one of the problems that we, you know, we put, uh, we address through risk constraints and, that was our, our, our design decision point. Um, but I'll even be happy if somebody's willing to do part of that, even if they don't invest in a whole documentation set. Mm. I'd rather sit down and architect and capture in a one pager, even though it's not a proper architecture document, mm. just to capture what the business outcomes are. Because if you don't know what you're trying to achieve and you can't agree on that, mm. then you're never going to hit you know a success criteria. Yeah, absolutely. And I was actually having a chat with uh, with a good partner of mine uh, from years ago, uh, just the other day. And I said, look, I don't want to just give you a ballpark. Here's what it's going to cost to design and implement, because we don't really know what we're designing and implementing yet. I'd love to come in, do a current state assessment, work out what you're trying to do and where you're starting from and go from there. Um, and they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like it's it's not they're not getting a purchase order for hardware today. They're delaying that until the architecture is done. And, you know, they're really happy with that. So it's not like customers and partners are not willing to change. It's just someone needs to stand up and say, all right, we need to look at this first. Um, and we don't need to delay the sales cycle very long. Um, we can do it quite quickly. Um, and like you say as well, a, a current state assessment or a design does not have to be weeks, months, years worth of work. It can be a very short express version for a small customer. Um, but as long as you go through the phases, you can accelerate those phases. Um, you don't have to write 200 page document for a three node cluster necessarily, right? So, you know. I mean, you could, but nobody wants to read that. Yeah, nobody wants to read it, but it's also oftentimes unnecessary. Um, so, you know, a lot of the stuff we, we do, you know, certainly I'm sure you've done the same in the past. A lot of your decisions are reusable. You've seen customers use a certain technology or product for the same use case 50 times. Cool. You're very confident it's going to be used in that way. You're just going to double check everything before you go ahead and implement in that way. Cool. We can do that quite quickly and cost effectively while still following that methodology and ensuring that good outcome. So, so you know, you bring up templatizing, right? Um, and as I, you know, we did the VCDX program, when I was writing my documents, 
even then I was like, well, if I'm writing these, I'm not going to write them for the, the customer I'm implementing this for. I'm going to write them in such a generic way that this will be usable everywhere. Yeah. Uh, every customer I can take this to every single customer. So templatizing everything was great. Right. Uh, I started, you know, with the, uh, the operations guides, the installation guides, the validation guides, things that were easy for me at the time. And then I moved into the architecture and design guides and tried to templatize that just at least for sections and uh, a consistent flow of information. Uh, but the biggest value there, I think, is to my customers. Because um, if we do a, a VDI project, well, that's usually, you know, a two-week architecture design, bringing all their pieces, finding out, you know, how they're going to manage users and profiles or devices and deliver mm -hmm. desktops and what they actually require. That's about two weeks. And they, you know, they say, oh, well, don't you have this template? Can't, you know, why are you charging me two weeks? Shouldn't that be like a couple of days? Cause you know, all this already. Well, no, it's actually the other way around. It would be like four or six weeks if I had to write all of this from scratch for you. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of customers who do work with VCDXs get, get a lot of that experience. They bring a lot of that documentation. And most of us that I know have prepped our documentation in a way we can reuse it quickly and efficiently uh, and pass on those savings to customers and hit those timelines that you were talking about. It doesn't have to be weeks and months long. Mm, exactly. And also they get a good artifact, the customer at the end of that project as well. It's like, here's your artifact, here's the decisions, here's what we've done. And yeah, that document's probably worth two or three times what you've actually been billed because it was templatized. So I, th I think it's a no-brainer, um, and I just follow that process because I feel like if I follow a good proven methodology, the chance of the customer getting a good outcome is like 99.9%, .9%, and that's what I'm focused on. So if someone asks me to cut corners, straight away I'm like, I don't feel good about this because that 99.9 .9 drops to 80, and I don't want to be dealing with that 20%. Um, if yeah. that happens so and i certainly don't want the customer to deal with it either so yeah to me i'd prefer to walk away from a project um then you know do something that the customer would then come back and say hey why didn't you just push back so yeah to me over my career i've been more and more comfortable pushing back um because i know what the good outcome looks like and i know what the bad outcome looks like and i'm just not willing to go down that route um so occasionally you better say person will be annoyed at you because you won't do x y or z but i'm doing it for you you know <laughs> i always say to people in australia we always use the word mate hey mate i'm always, i'm just doing this for you i just want to make sure your customer is happy so just trust me right and uh you know sometimes it's like oh we'll find someone else okay find someone else but i'm here to help when it goes wrong by the way i just don't want to be the person who makes it go wrong um, and it'll be twice as expensive when it goes wrong Oh, at least. Yeah, it's, it's way cheaper to do it right the first time, um, which is why I always like to design first. It's just, it's a better outcome and it's cheaper. Uh, there's a, a quote, I, I wish I could remember who, who said it, right? But, uh, and I don't even know if it's somebody famous, but I just, it, it's, it's stuck with me. And that's, if you don't have the time to do it right in the first place, how are you ever going to find time to clean it up after? Yeah, that's a good one. I've heard that before. I'm not sure who said it either, but uh, it's a Whoever very said it kudos thank you very much it's so true yeah yeah there's another one which is uh you see it in a an old mechanic workshop it's like um if i do it for you it's one price if if you watch it's you know uh, double the price if, if you help it's triple the price yeah. uh, you know a lot of the time it's it's much easier to get things done uh without having 10 people in the room watching um, but at the same time, as, as a VCDX and, and as a company who are providing partner-to-partner -partner services, we actually want people to be shadowing. So, you know, we factor that in. Yes, it will take a bit longer, but at least that knowledge transfer will happen. The mentoring can happen. And, you know, there's value at the end of that. So you bring up a good point that I see a lot of companies struggle with. How to, how to empower and... Uh provide continuing education in the form of mentorship and apprenticeship like that. Mm. Um, and at my office, we absolutely recommend uh, doing that, right? Um, we'll take that and we'll put the hours uh, against the projects, right? We're not doing it to make sure that we account for every moment of our time. We mm. keep track of our hours to see how good we are at our pre-sales activities and scoping projects. Mm. Um, but when we're going to have a junior come alongside us, we have a special uh, designation for that, right? That's continuing education that they write up against. 
Uh, it's not that they're built. And we assume that it's going to take an extra 20, 30, 40%, depending on, on the tasks that we're, we're mm -hmm. taking them on. But if they're never given the opportunity to participate, they're never going to gain that confidence. They're never going to gain that experience. Maybe it's just to get certified. Maybe they just like to do the work. Mm -hmm. But we're absolutely ecstatic doing that. And uh, we're, absolutely, we're able to grow our, our skill sets internally and take our integration folks and bring them up to engineering. And then our engineers become team leads or practice leads or SMEs, but they only get to do that because someone gave them the opportunity to do that. Yeah. And uh, it's a shame that not every company perceives it that way. Well, it's, it's also a shame that most companies don't have people who can do the mentoring. Um, so, you know, That's obviously there, there's a lot of smart people out there as well, but I think one of the things that, that I'm trying to provide is if a company has that layer one covered and the layer two covered, but they don't have layer three or four, Great, we can come in, complement their existing workforce, and help mentor and bring them up. So, you know, to me, if I help a company grow a VCDX level person, and they no longer need, you know, my team's help, first of all, that they'll always need something, right? No one knows everything. <laughs> but in in theory, if they never needed to use end to end again, I'm okay with that. The market is enormous. It's not like there's not enough business to keep me busy for a lifetime anyway. So. I would more than happily mentor up, you know, a partner and then have them take on that piece themselves. I mean, that's part of the value. Yeah. And uh, I think that's going to be part of the value we can share with each other as, as you yeah. know, you continue to, to, to grow those partnerships and alliances with partners around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, especially, you know, working with Common Division is a great example. It's such an experienced team that they have some skills in areas where it's just really specialized and very deep that I don't have so that the partnership works very well. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they know certain products better than anyone, better than the vendors that's that make the products. Um, and I mean, let's just call it right. I mean, they're masters of vCloud director, hmm. right? I mean, they've done hundreds of implementations. They train VMware on, <laughs> on vCloud director. Uh, they write the education material. I mean, they're, they're geniuses with that kind of product. And that's just one, you know, that's just the one example. That's the one that I've even talked to Eves about mm. over the years that, hey, we've got folks that are considering this. Can we use you? Mm. And, you know, of course, they were more than accommodating. Mm, absolutely. So, yeah, I think it's exciting times. But I guess summarizing our point about architecting for everyone out there listening, get your architect involved. The moment you're talking to a customer or the moment you're talking to a vendor, get your architect involved straight away so they can start working on the conceptual layer, which is simply what is the business trying to achieve? What are you, what's the concept? Um, and then from there, once that's well-defined and agreed and measurable, then you can go down the route of logical and physical. And for those who are not aware of conceptual, logical and physical, in IT, we always jump to selling hardware, which is a physical layer, and we do the architecture last, which is the exact opposite order. So make sure we understand what we're trying to achieve before we're even thinking about the hardware vendor, the software vendor, or any of those pieces. That comes way down the track. Um, so, yeah, get your architect involved early. You won't regret it, and uh, you will actually more than likely speed up your business outcome even though some parts of it, such as the sales process, might be slightly delayed, the overall project will usually be to, to be completed faster and to a higher standard. And, you know, just to bring it up, because I always talk about this when, when I'm at these workshops and doing the VCDX workshops uh, and attending them. Hmm. If you work for a reseller, your example is perfect, right? We're working with our clients. We're getting them to a, an end result. But if you work internally at an organization and you're the architect, you still have clients. Mm. They're just called business groups and other team members and you know sister companies or whatnot that you're trying to help meet their needs. The same way someone who might work at a reseller or a, a hardware vendor brings in their architect to help you meet those business outcomes. Mm. So you still have that opportunity in the large organizations if, and you're not working uh, in a sales kind of approach for a reseller or a services company or a vendor. So Absolutely. internal folk need to follow the same methodology. Um, if anything, internal people often have more constraints they're working within. So following a methodology to ensure they don't make a mistake that they potentially can't afford to recover from becomes even more important. So 
you know, in I, I use this example on the cube in Australia, our average customer size is significantly smaller than the average US customer. So you would think, oh, okay, they won't be able to afford good architecture. It's kind of the opposite. Like if you're constrained in your IT spend and you don't have as many resources, well, your architecture has got to be spot on to deliver that outcome. Whereas if you've got, you know, a reasonably large budget, you can make a few mistakes here and there and then fix them and replace it and have some redundant hardware sitting over here or have a bit of shelfware software over there. In Australia, that luxury we don't have for sure in most companies. You know, average customer size might only have, you know, six or 10 nodes or something, right? They can't afford to screw up sizing. They can't just add a node whenever they want. So the architecture piece, you know, is even more critical for the smaller customers in a lot of cases. And it's more complex because there's more constraints to deal with, both, you know, commercial and technical. And uh, that's true when I always make the analogies with architecture, similar to the way that you said, I think it was Arashid was talking about building the 40th floor apartment, right? Uh, you know, build that foundation solid, right? Once you get the solid foundation of whatever it is that you're trying to build, you can build anything on top of it. But once it's built, mm. you can't go back and fix a foundation, right? And that's going to be true if you're buying a 10 million square foot home or if you're buying, uh, you know, the 600 uh, square foot um, lake cottage house. Right. Mm. It's still going to have that same requirement that that lake cottage house, you might be constrained by real estate, not money. Mm. And you still want to make sure you have all the, you know, the amenities. Well, an architect's going to help make sure you can get that done. And that would be, you know. The, the Mike Brady architect, right? Yeah. Uh, that we've we've grown up and loved on the Brady Bunch, right? He designed homes and, and office spaces. It's the same in the IT space, right? I mean, uh, and I think more, the more and more people are starting to realize what you've been championing for many years, and many of us have agreed with and also been championing uh, that bringing those folks on board is going to be great, right? And mm. Again, if we're all contributing and mentoring and trying to help others achieve that level of skill set, we're in for a good run for the next 20 years. I think so. And, you know, I've, I've had a couple of people, you know, even friends sort of outside of IT say to me, why are you helping grow more of these certifications that it took you so long to get and so rare and must be very valuable, whatever? I'm like, yeah, look, it's valuable, but that there's also, if it's not well known, then how valuable can something be? So, you know, if there's 300 VCDXs, most people don't know what that means, first of all. So that's part of my marketing is just educating people what that actually means. And then, you know, if we then get a thousand of them, then a thousand customers are going to have realized the benefit of that skill set or 10,000. You might have 10 customers each or something like that. If there's 10,000 VCDXs, like there are CCIEs, People go, oh, wow, CCIE, I know what that is. Those guys are really smart. I want one of those. They're not 100% sure how you get CCIE. They're not exactly sure what it really means, but they know it's really good. And yeah, that's where branding has done. hasn't got yet. Like VCDX, hopefully, in the next 12 or 12 or 24 months, we'll get to the point where people go, oh, I want one of those VCDXs. I know they're really good. They're kind of like CCIEs. You know, we need that for multi-cloud, you know, for, for complex environment, hyperscaler solutions, whatever. That's who we need. So fingers crossed we have a podcast in two years and we can say we did it. People know what BCDX is now. So, you know, and I think one of the other challenges that people would ever have about working with or knowing about VCDXs, you know, right now we're at 300, right? 300 VCDXs. Well, about a third of those work at VMware. About a third of those work inside of vendors. So we're talking Cisco, HP, Lenovo, you know, uh, Dell, so on and so forth, right? That means there's only about a third or a hundred of them out in the wild globally. Mm. So, I mean, not everybody gets exposed to, to be able to work with someone at that architecture level. Um, I mean, we were at dinner, right? And uh, if, uh, at VMware Explorer, right? That was myself, you, and John Arashid at dinner. Mm. And when you count that out, that's 1% of the entire population of the VCDXs just at yeah. one table. Um, and it's, you know, it's just amusing to think that it's still such low awareness from a customer perspective, what these things actually mean mm. uh, and what value that they would get from working with someone who, who brings those credentials to the table. So, yeah, you know, we, do a, we do a pretty good job of, you know, announcing it. 
if you've ever gotten an email from me, you can see I have way too many badges from all, you know all the different certifications that I've had. Uh, it's not to annoy everyone, <laughs> but it's just to keep folks informed that continuing education is something that I find extremely valuable and important. Mm. Um, and, and it is absolutely. So I think you know one thing I was speaking with the the local VMware team here in Australia about was you know the fact that over the years you know even though you know my focus areas changed and varied over the years you know, still learning, regardless of what the topic was, is something I always focused on. So, you know, whether it was updating a VCP or it was doing a VCAP or it was doing another vendor certification, you know, I was always focused on raising my own bar. Um, so, yeah, for VM Explore in Singapore, uh, they just released a video where I'm talking about the value of VCDX and the master service competencies um, from a partner perspective. So, you know, actually, in fact, at the VCDX town hall, we were talking about the the master competencies, and we feel like they should be tied to VCDX. Um, yeah. because that's the the level um, that you know partners really should be aspiring to, and and that's the gap in the market. Um, in fact, if you didn't see it, uh, Keith Townsend and I also caught up and did a bit of a video uh, talking about that gap, and really talking about the gap, um, like we said in the the town hall, is the VCAP level. Like we're not even talking about VCDX being the gap. It's there's not enough VCAP people, let alone getting enough candidates for VCDX. So, you know, I think that's the the main bottleneck. Well, that's a continuing education challenge, right? Um, the exams are not free, right? So, I mean, they're not tremendously expensive. What I mean, in US, I think it's US dollars. It's two hundred dollars for a VMware certified professional or the VCP exam. Mm. But that's not, you know, most people can get over that barrier. The barrier they can't get over is the $4,000 class that's required to get to, to be allowed to sit for that first exam. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people who could go into that certif certification program, maybe they have the skills and the drive, but they just don't have the, the, the capabilities from a financial perspective, whatever that may be. Mm. Uh, VCAPs, you know, they're what, four or $500 exams. Mm. Uh, again, that's not the most difficult obstacle. But if you work for a company that reimburses you for successfully completing an exam, they'll, they'll reimburse you for the cost of that. Mm. That makes your, you know, your journey a little easier and the pill a little better to swallow. Um, yeah, you know, you'll still study very hard because you don't, you know, you know, they won't pay you, if, um, if reimburse you if you don't pass. Yeah. But, you, you know, that just means study harder so you don't fail. Mm. Um, but it's real. Yeah. Uh, the turnaround numbers do seem low. It's just as though not necessarily the uh, individuals, but a combination of individuals and organizations don't see the value mm -hmm. in benchmarking uh, your skill sets. And then if you work for a reseller or someone who provides services, you should absolutely champion in that. The more people you have who are skilled and validated on that, mm -hmm. um, especially with the hands-on kind of exams, the way that those VCAP level exams are today, mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's a pretty good baseline. Uh, so I'm really just, I'm surprised too. I think there's still what, uh, in all of Asia Pacific, I think there's still only one VCDX uh, for the end user compute stack. Hmm, that's right. Yeah. So, hey, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> nice to know you. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, it's true. It's, it's crazy. And, and look, I think there's only 20 or something cloud VCDXs in the world as well. Um, and NV, I think there's only about 30. Like, there's not a huge number. Uh, obviously, you know, the data center virtualization is the the far more popular, um, and it's effectively the the base layer for all the others, um, which makes sense. There's a lot more, um, but yeah, absolutely. I think continuous learning is so important, and yeah, it's to me building a business around people who are continuous learners makes perfect sense, but that the market is uh, a little bit different. But I think, you know, if VMware, shout out to all the, all our friends in the partners community at VMware, if if VCDX became a requirement for the master service competencies, I bet you that number would double very quickly. Um, and you all know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so hopefully that happens because I think if the master service competencies uh, do require VCDX, it'll effectively just result in better outcomes for customers. And it'll be quite and it'll, as well. And it will drive partners and service, service service organizations into achieving that certification. Right now, 
they may not see that there's a value from from the software company. All of a sudden, this this premier whatever partner level uh, mm -hmm. and a master service competency, which gains you visibility to even customers you don't have already, or gains additional faith and trust from customers you already work with. I mean, I think that that's very appropriate. And when we started talking about that at VMware Explore, it was received really well by the uh, uh, by the community sitting there at the VCDX town hall. Uh, mm -hmm. It resonated well. Um, We'll just hopefully we'll start to see something like that to help drive those levels of certifications, because I know a lot of smart individuals, mm. some I work with, some, I, you know, some are customers, some are peers, uh, a lot, you know, a lot of them, even the clients that I start to see, uh, they have some really amazing skill sets uh, and I, they're, they've never gone through and done a certification. Mm. They just learn on the job for the job. And I mean, they're phenomenal at it. But I would love to see them go out and just get certified just to go ahead and have the company that they work for validate that they're employing good people that they can trust with the, uh, with the outcomes that they're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the more value, you know, we as VCDXs and VMware can put on that VCDX, uh, the more people will go for it. And I think, you know, Com Division obviously is a great example of this. So they have two VCDXs, which is already, you know, amazing to have to have two. They have probably have half a dozen people who are already operating at above a VCDX level. Um, they've been doing it for a long time. They follow the same methodology as an approach, um, but they haven't gone and got the certification simply because they already have the master service competencies. So shout out, you know, Com Division and, and the Alliance with End to End have all eight master service competencies. So why would we need more VCDXs? We already have all the competencies. Well, hopefully the master service competency level gets raised to another level where we have to continually keep chasing it. Uh, and I think that'll drive value for customers and it'll make sure that we're all continually learning, which we are anyway, but it'll just give us a real uh, carrot uh, approach, uh, the, the carrot and the stick approach. Um, I think if they do that, the carrot will be sitting there for us to keep chasing. Um, whereas at the moment, the, there's no real disadvantage um, by not having those people go through or by having those people who are not certified, not do it. Well, so, you know, one of the things that I always did, um, even with VCP, right? So VMware is actually my longest running certification from mm. one vendor, right? Um, it used to be Novell Netware, <laughs> uh, which uh, most people don't even know about, right? But uh, uh, I think I did that for six years, got four different versions of certifications. Mm. Um, with VMware, I got version the, the first version, which was on version two of ESX, because mm. uh, that was the first one with vCenter, uh, and then version two, three, four, five, six. Then they changed to the year designation, mm. so that's 2020, 2022, uh, and I'm going to be recertifying again next year across all of those those uh, those certs, right? And uh, well, I don't do a lot of hands-on VMware work. Um, we have a team, I built a practice at WEI mm -hmm. and that team runs itself and they do all the delivery and they do a lot of the scoping, their SMEs and all of this as well. Mm -hmm. So kudos to that team for, um, you know, becoming what they are. Um, but I still need to know when I'm having a conversation, what the new features are, what the new designs are, what the constraints might have uh, changed mm -hmm. as we're building these infrastructures. So I still maintain, uh, something I don't practice on a daily basis. Um, plus it also That's helps when I teach when you most people is because you have the architecture skills, but you're maintaining the hands on. And I think what we see in the market is people elevate their career as architects. They get to senior solution architect, principal architect, whatever. And then they get put into this enterprise architecture role where they're actually really just doing solution architecture and they don't keep their skills up to date and they quickly become fairly low value, or if anything, they become a negative value because they're preaching things that are outdated, creating problems inadvertently because they weren't up to date. So I think any architect, um, any expert level architect like yourself does exactly that. They keep up to date, even if it's not every single day hands on, you need to know the new features and capabilities and play with it every now and again to make sure you're making good decisions and that those decisions reflect the reality of the product. Um, I've seen so many times over the years where an architect makes a decision or a recommendation based on the marketing slides of a product. 
or the architecture as it's affectionately known and uh. it doesn't work in reality so you know yes you can run a cluster with three nodes at at 80 capacity if you want right but what happens when you do an upgrade you know what happens if you have a, a failure what happens in all these scenarios day two operations um it's a bad day for the customer so you know just simple things like that uh, i've seen so much over the years but the moment you introduce an architect who continually plays with the product they can help inform product management on the right ways to go about things uh, on the prioritization of features or the minimally viable product level for a feature um, you know how to deploy the solution uh, to a minimally viable um, position for day two and not just day one for the benchmark to publish the the high iops number it's how does it work after an upgrade or after a failure uh, and things like that so yeah kudos sure. to you for keeping up with it because that's what i'm trying to champion in the market uh, and luckily my team and the com division team are, are already on the same page on that so i don't have to work hard internally i have to work hard externally uh, so one of the uh side advantages here is i've always championed and loved to teach mm -hmm. uh, so i've been teaching a vmware workshop you know how to use it all the features all the bells and whistles for about 22 years mm -hmm. since version one uh, came out and um i still teach that today and if i wasn't constantly so the way i actually absorb all the new material i'll read the entire set of documentation for the new version release Boring, I know, right? But I make an outline of everything that's just net new, mm. All right? That might, you know, I might take 4,000 pages down to 30 pages of notes, mm. whatever it is. Um, and then I'll inject that into my course. But by forcing myself to inject it into an outline form, I'm thinking about how that could impact X, Y, Z. Which major category does that belong to? How would that affect, you know, what I've done before? Just because I've always done it this way, I could take on this new approach and what would that offer me? And then having to articulate that and teach that six, eight times a year uh, to a group of, you know, 10, 20 students. That's a lot of fun, right? Because when you see their eyes light up, um, and I think that's why so many of us do give back to the community. It's because when you see the spark of life come into someone's eyes, when they understand something that they've been struggling to grasp, be it a concept or a technology or even passing an exam, mm. um, that brings a lot of joy to a lot of folks. Yeah, it really does, for sure. Like, you know, I remember mentoring a, a lot of ECDX candidates and, you know, the first time everyone wants to do a mock panel and I'm like, cool, let's do a mock panel. Let's find out where your baseline is. Um, you might be amazing and you need one and I just say, go for it. Or you might need 50, like it doesn't matter, but you do a mock panel and then you can see in their eye, oh, I don't know this. And then you see in the subsequent mock panels, after they've done a bit more preparation and they've understood the methodologies a bit better, you see the confidence come out of the person. And, you know, when they're asked a question, they get excited to answer the question as opposed to, you know, am I going to get this right uh, type situation. So, yeah, I really enjoy that. And seeing someone progress from, you know, not really being able to justify what they're doing and, and talk to it confidently to being very confident, answering questions quickly and concisely, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, well, it's taking someone through their journey. Yeah, and I think all of us get something out of it as well. Like, you know, everyone says, oh, you spend a lot of time mentoring people. You know, that's that's very generous. What do you get out of it? I get a lot out of it, actually. First of all, I get enjoyment, like, so that's really good. I get to build a network. Um, like I was talking to Melissa Palmer about her journey. She's like, oh, you know, I was one of the people who inspired her to start the journey. I'm like, fantastic. Well, guess what? seven or eight years later, she's working with me now. So, I mean, it, it, it all paid off. Um, and she so, does have a nice book called The Journey. Yeah. So anybody that, that's running down that path, uh, Melissa Palmer wrote a great book on that under the IT Architect series. Um, and uh, it's something I hand out to a lot of folks who are just getting started. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just makes it a little easier for people to consume because it offers multiple ways to approach that process. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think, yeah, mentoring is great and it's it's a win-win for everyone. And funnily enough, as like doing expert level um, architecture certification development as well, helped me challenge myself to be better. Uh, being a panelist helped me learn from other people presenting. Um, doing mock panels helps you learn as well. You ask a question, you might not even know what the answer is, but the candidate then tells you the answer and you go, oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. 
they never know that you didn't know this, but it's it's part of that continuous learning that uh, even being a mentor, you're learning from mentoring. It's funny how we keep saying the words skill gap, continuing education, uh, and you know, then we always focus on helping others. Those are three common points that I've heard throughout this call. Yeah, and uh, and it hasn't changed. I would say in, in all the time that I've been you know focusing my attention on trying to be the best architect I can be, those things have remained consistent in the market. Um, so I feel like people like us have tried to make ourselves better while the market stood still. So it wasn't really that we were some amazing you know geniuses. And I always say to people, I'm certainly not a genius. Um, so if I can achieve VCDX. I mean, anyone who wants to put in the effort could definitely achieve it. Um, it's not insurmountable or, or impossible or requires some level of genius. It, it just requires you to put in some effort. Um, and, and what is it? Uh, there's a, what is it? It's Phoebe Kim, right? Uh, she's mm -hmm. a VMware employee. She got started and moved into the uh, uh, a higher role. And the team there challenged her to get her VCDX, mm -hmm. which she nailed in what, two, three months. And then she did a second one like two months later. And then she did a third one a few months later. Mm. So as you're saying, it's not an insurmountable task. If you set your mind to it, you can absolutely achieve it. And yeah, the first VCDX, if for those that want to get multiples, the first mm. one's harder, the sure. hardest, right? Because you have to do all of the uh, paperwork and then you have to deal with the defense. Mm. The second one, you still have to do all of the exams and the paperwork, but you don't have to actually go and do the three hour long defense that I think everyone is really scared of. Mm. The three hour defense in my mind, that's just a really good customer meeting. Mm. That, exactly. To me, that's what it is. Meeting and it, you can show your skills. It's an opportunity you're given to show how experienced and valuable you are to your customers. So yeah, I don't think you should be intimidated by it. I really enjoyed mine, actually. I, funnily enough, I said at the end, they said, oh, is there anything you'd like to say before we, you know, before you leave the room? And I just said, oh, I really enjoyed this. You know, I've had a great time. So whether I passed or failed, I've enjoyed it. And uh, Josh, I wish I could remember what happened after mine was over, but I was terrified <laughs> and glad it was over. So <laughs> I've changed a lot since then. But back then, uh, I mean, that was 2009, so 14 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, mine was 2012, so still a long time ago. But uh, no, I remember it well. It was it was really good fun. Right. Um, so basically, we, we've covered off the huge problem in IT, which is skills gap and people not wanting continuous learning and all this. We've also talked about we're going to put architecture first. We're not going to wait till we've bought stuff and, and we're implementing it before we design. So we're always going to architect first. So... We've also touched on partner to partner. So this is something that obviously my business is focused on and, and we're talking about how we can help each other. You know, let's maybe jump into that a bit further. Um, sure. You know, why would a partner like WEI, who are very well established, very well known, have a great reputation, why would you want to potentially partner with someone else? All right. Well, a lot of why would we want to do it is because, Josh, you and I understand what this is about. I understand what you're bringing to the table. You understand what we bring to the table, WEI brings to the table, and we can benefit uh, and share skill sets. Just because you have, I think you said, four VCDXs right now on staff does not mean they know everything, right? That's just not the way it works. In my organization, um, you know, I'm really good with the VMware side, the Nutanix side. I can do VDI. I can do network virtualization to some, some level. But you know what? We have two other people in the organization who are masters of the network virtualization. They've really mastered the VDI side of the world. Um, but, you know, uh, we brought in folks that do AWS, right? They built, they're built, they building that, that practice the same way we built the virtualization practice and extending out that, that division of our, our company. Uh, we brought in the Azure people, and we're extending that out. Um, and then we still have this giant network team. And you know what? Networking has always been this, you know, mystery group to most of us, right? It's the network guy's fault, right? It's always some firewall rule. Well, that might be a joke and it might be true sometimes, right? Um, but we have a 35 person high end in, you know, networking team that draws and designs and implements uh, gear on, you know, projects there go on the term of years. Hmm. So maybe on the networking side, we just don't have the, the, the bandwidth, right? You know, most of our guys have their schedules committed for, you know, 60 to 180 days. And mm. the project scopes are showing them booked out for three years. Uh, so, 
yeah, we're always going to need some help, right? Wouldn't it be great if I needed that high-end network resource that I could go to a partner that I have a good relationship with, that I can trust, that can wear, our, you know, that can come in knowingly, you know, hey, we're going to be very honest with our customers. We always tell them when we have a partner that we're working with, mm-hmm. and we always tell them why. Um, hey, you know, I'm good with VMware on AWS or Nutanix on um, on Azure or in AWS, but maybe I have a quick skills gap. Um, but if I had to implement um, VMware on Google Cloud, right, mm. uh, the GC uh, VE right now, uh, maybe it's just because we haven't had time to focus on that particular skill set. Mm. So I think the reason that I have no problem uh, considering partnerships with other partners that we can trust, we have a good relationship, we're not, as we discussed earlier, we're not worried about someone poaching a customer or a deal or, you know, whatever, uh, an employee we have those good relationships. We can trust each other and we all hold ourselves to a high level of quality for work. We want to make sure the customer gets the best experience and we're going to design and scope and plan for the right amount of time to accomplish the right business outcomes. Um, But just because we can plan and do all of that doesn't mean we can deliver every single thing. And I'm sure there are skills that, you know, you and your team will look to others, right? Uh, I'd be surprised if you were all masters of VMware Cloud, uh, a v, v Cloud director, right? That might be something you could lean on that comm division group for, right? Absolutely. Uh, and this is the, the thing, right? When when I was speaking to Eve about our alliance, it's it makes perfect sense that at the expert level, I can't be an expert in, you know, all four VCDX tracks, for example. Even if I could achieve all four, right, I might focus on, you know, desktop this year and cloud the next year and network the next year. <laughs> By the time I've got through network, maybe my desktop skills have, have dropped off a little bit, uh, even though I might still be certified. It, it doesn't make sense to try and boil the ocean as an individual or as a company. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, Comm Division are vCloud director experts for sure. I'm a, a VCDX in, in cloud, and for sure their team knows more about vCloud director than I do. Right? They do it day in, day out with large service providers, right? Um, and, you know, it makes sense. You use that team for the speciality that they have um, and they'll use my team for the speciality and we'll deliver a consistent outcome. So that's all. And that helps us, yeah, that'll help us get over that skills gap initially. But in order for us to do that, since you and I have a rapport, we already have something called trust. Mm. Um, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but in corporate America, you know, you talk a lot to lawyers, there's a, I think there's a lot of lack of trust, and that could be for many different reasons. That probably is a whole different show for you, right? Uh, but that's something that we see in America quite often, right? Everything's litigious. Mm. Yeah, it's very disappointing because I think we can all benefit from each other. Uh, and, yeah, the whole litigious nature of, of the world, obviously the U.S. has sort of led that revolution a little bit, but uh, it's, you know, it seems ridiculous to me that we're, handcuffing each other from getting better with litigation um but uh, it is what it is but that the thing oh, yeah. about trust you know we have the trust we know each other a long time our values are very well aligned um and it makes sense to work with people who you trust and your values align and you know it could be a very simple thing an end-to-end customer you know might have an office you know, in the East Coast of the US that, that I can't get someone to in a timely manner and I can make a quick call to you and say, hey, here's the design, here's what we're doing, you know, we've got NDAs, it's all good. You guys can can do that piece, um, you know, to the design standard that, that I put out and, and vice versa. And most importantly, we can always do something when we're reading a document, something that we've learned is an important thing to say. Mm. Huh, I don't know what that means. Mm. Let me go find out. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, that's good as well. Like, you know, if, if we're working together on a project, then, you know, when I share a design with you and you review it to make sure your team has got the right pieces to deploy, you might see a gap that we can then peer review and make it better and make sure the customer outcome is to an even higher standard. So that continuous learning happens on every single project and for you know, I don't know any VCDX who thinks they know everything and that thinks that their design's perfect. Um, you know, they might be very, very good, but they're never perfect. And every time I peer review someone's work or vice versa, we both get something out of it. So I enjoy it. 
Yeah, that's how I learned snapshots are not backups. Oh, what? No, just, Hang on, what? Snapshots are... <laughs> when, did, when did this come out? I, I hadn't, hadn't heard about this. Uh, oh, I, I still see that often enough, believe it or not, in, the, in today's day and age. Uh, so it's, I wish it was a, a well-known issue. It's, There's yeah, a lot of- We names, all have our horror stories. Uh, it still seems to be uh, yeah, a common problem for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that, you know, getting together with partnership, not only that, um, being exposed to new things, um, you meet new friends, you meet new networks, uh, you get new peers. Uh, and you know what? All of a sudden, maybe now you found yourself another mentor, a thing that's very challenging. And, you know, you brought it up uh, earlier today. Uh, you know, maybe they'd be, you know, you'd be willing to mentor you know, uh, a customer or, a, you know, your, your partners so that they could take on those skill sets. Like you said, there's plenty of work, right? If we can all, we start building that better network. Mm. It seems that most of us at the higher level certified levels at the higher enterprise architects levels, there's a greater percentage of us willing to mentor individuals and help them empower and better mm. themselves. Yeah, definitely. Cause I think we've identified that there is a skills gap. And even if we doubled, tripled, quadrupled the number of ECDXs in the world, we're still going to be very, very busy for a very long time. Um, and we're still going to be very valuable. If anything, we're going to be more valuable as that level of ECDXs uh, increases. Um, so, yeah, I'm not in the slightest bit worried. As a company who have a focus on having ECDXs, if the number doubled tomorrow, I'd be very happy. So, yeah, hopefully we can help Carl Childs grow the program and uh, yeah, get a lot more of us. It'll happen. Uh, it'll happen soon. I hope. Um, I'm just excited that there seemed to be. Uh, did you attend the the? I can't remember the VCDX workshop this year. Had so so many more people than I expected who are actively participating in the discussions mm. uh, versus just one or two individuals. So that that got me really excited to see you know who my new potential hires are going to be. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I think anyone who's attempting to go on that VCDX journey is already an attractive proposition for an employer uh, because they have the uh, that continuous learning uh, methodology that they're following. They're trying to challenge themselves and straight away to me that's a, an attractive quality for an employee, someone who's willing to take on a challenge, something that is difficult uh, and that does take time. Um, for a long or a medium term goal. Um, I mean, just to, to give people a timeline, um, even though I've been doing VMware work for a, a long time at this point, um, I from VC from when I sat my VCP four exam to when I received the email that I'd passed the defense for VCDX four, uh, that was nine months. And James Worth, one of my my team, and I said we want to do this. We want to get VCDX for the last defenses in Toronto. Let's do it. So we, we gave ourselves that deadline. We had to do our VCP, our VCAPs, get our designs ready, and then submit. Uh, and we both successfully achieved that in nine months. So if someone has got VMware expertise and they haven't done any of their exams or even they've only done some, it doesn't have to take you two years or four years. I mean, we put in a lot of time, don't get me wrong, right? It wasn't an insignificant investment in time, but the duration, you know, was only nine months. Um, so I was lucky I was also working on a, a suitable project at the time, like there was some timing uh -huh. that helped out. But, you know, I would say if you set your target of being a VCDX in, in 12 or 18 months time, that's a very achievable timeline, even if everything doesn't fall into place. And that's not that far away. Like if you're looking at, getting a promotion or, you know, moving into, you know, a new job or, or starting something for yourself, 18 months is pretty close. So, yeah. you know, that there's not really a reason not to take it on. And if you end up stopping at the double VCAP level, you're already at the, the top like 2% of skills in the market. And double VCAP is a very valuable position to be in uh, with that VCIX uh, badge that you get for it. Um, so, yeah, that there's no failing if, if you end up not submitting your design for the defense for, for some reason, um, you're a VCIX. Awesome. That's fantastic. If you don't meet your timelines, there's always going to be another defense. Yep. Not everyone hits every goal that they've set for themselves the first time out. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely. So, 
just keep at it. It's a, it's a never ending journey. You get your VCDX and all you've really learned is how much you don't know. Um, so it's, uh, it's fun. Uh, um, so yeah. actually that brings us to, uh, we've already covered off some of it, but I wanted to, to hear about your VCDX journey in a bit more depth because as an early VCDX, you mentioned it was very difficult and there wasn't a lot of information. Um, so we've sort of talked about the past. What about the present and the future of your VCDX journey, which is obviously ongoing? Well, you, I can start with the past. That's easy, right? I mean, um, so I was a professional acronym collector, right? <laughs> Every certification that came by, you know, I had MCSE this or CN. I even did my CCNP and my CCDP level certifications on the network side. I thought I was going to go be a CCIE back in the day. Mm. Uh, and then right around 2001, the end of 2001, somewhere in 2002, early, uh, I found this thing called VMware. I mean, I had played with the workstation product back in the late 90s. Mm. And I thought that was cool because that would change the way my home labs were built back in the day. I would stop having a couple of PCs with hot swappable drives. Mm. Uh, um, and yeah, I kind of got it, but then I forgot all about it. Uh, and then I saw it come through and it, it was uh, actually uh, IBM when they brought in uh, a specific server line, the Explore 40. It was something that we could turn from four CPUs up to a 16 CPU node by just stacking mm. the nodes together. Mm. And, I remember that uh, as well, actually, yeah. And the, the, the customer wanted to go ahead and run big iron, right? This four node X6, X440 system four CPUs, uh, you know, per node. So that was 16 sockets total. And remember back then that was, there was no multi-core, right? So that was 16 sockets. You, that was a huge system. Mm. Um, and I discovered VMware there. And even then, um, I, I really didn't believe that it would do what it was supposed to do. Mm. Um, and when we start, when I started playing with it, um, I was like, wow, I get this, but the software was such a mess. Um, it didn't name things correctly. It had no naming standards. Everything was named default virtual machine or new virtual machine. Uh, it was Linux, right? And back in 2001, people were not, you know, so tolerant of Linux in the data center, right? That was still one of those faux pas or, you know, you were practicing voodoo if you were running Linux. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm thinking about this, right? The, all the things that I had to do to figure out this, right? And I had to do the installations for this. So I went and looking for documentation and there wasn't any, hmm. I mean, yeah, I told you to click next to do the install, but best practices, how, how do I, how do I design this? How do I build and architect this? Um, so I started developing content and as I started developing content, I'm like, wow, I get this. Hmm. I understand. I came from a storage background for digitals days when they had their storage work set up that compact got when they bought them, hmm. which then HP bought ended up with when they bought compact. Uh, so I brought in the Cisco uh, networking experience. I understood networking and VLANs and tagging and how to pass multiple networks down, right? That didn't help me day one in VMware. That came in, I think, two versions later where we could do multiple VLANs. But, you know, all of these foundations, all these skill sets were all coming together. I had my MCSE in 2003. So, you know, that was the major operating system people were running at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was really easy to put together a server storage and networking solution and bring those things together to play well. And because I found that I had to create my own documentation, my own installation guides, and then I developed my courses around that mm. um, to you know make it easy for people to, to take this on. Uh, I really just kind of wanted to achieve and be the best I could be. I even looked at becoming a, a, a VMware certified instructor or a VCI. Mm. And you know, I just like the freedom of not having to follow someone else's slide deck and take the conversation wherever it is and be honest. Uh, so I've always kind of steered away from that. But then uh, around the time uh, that vSphere 3 had been released, I was living in Phoenix. I took a short stint and lived in Phoenix, Arizona for a couple of years. Mm. Uh, and I had met uh, another VCDX uh, at the time. It was He was not, nobody was, uh, Doug Bear. Uh, mm. And Doug uh, saw something in me and he's like, listen, we do a bunch of the VMware education. Uh, and he dragged me along on that journey. And they were they started offering up some of these new second tier exams because it was only the VCP back then. Mm. 
So of course I signed up. I'm like, yeah, I'll take those. I'll be the first. I don't care. That'd be fun. And I started doing that. Uh, and then, you know, I got my VCAPs when they weren't even called VCAPs. They were just called advanced uh, exams. Mm. So taking on from that, I mean, then we go in uh, quite a few years into the vSphere 3 life cycle. They, I started to hear about this VCDX program from the same people who helped me take those beta exams. And they, they sent me the blueprint doc and said, do you want to do this or not? So I'm like, all right, I'll do this. Mm. Um, and it's funny, right? Because I, as I was starting to do that, I had just moved back to New Hampshire from Phoenix. I just took on a new role uh, as an engineer in a company. So I was responsible for pre, post, sales, delivery, the whole scope, right? A little bit in all all the different buckets and hats that I had to do. Uh, I was looking to buy a house. Uh, so I was also uh, going to finish up my uh, college degree. Mm. So I had all these other things going on. And I was going through and starting the BCDX process with no guidance. Mm. So what I had to do was prioritize. I had to stop doing my college right then because I wanted to prioritize on this this new certification. Mm -hmm. I finished the college later. Uh, but I spent weekends. Uh, I would go to the office because it was empty. I had a key. I would lock myself in there, crank up the tunes, and just go to town and start writing the documentation that I thought was going to be what somebody wanted to see and read. And that was absolutely terrifying because there was no one to to look up to the, the community that exists today doesn't ex did not exist the way it does. You mm -hmm. would only get to see people if you went to a VMUG meeting. Yeah. And even VMUGs were just, you know, just taking on some some uh, some life of their own, right? We had a really good community in, in New England. Um, it was what, 2,000, 2,400 strong mm -hmm. uh, that would attend these events. And that was really cool. Uh, but if you're the smartest guy in the room and you have no one to look up to, you kind of feel lost. And I felt like that throughout the entire process, mm. uh, just because we didn't have the tools we have today to reach out and make connections. So inside, I was absolutely in turmoil, you know, doubting myself, questioning myself at every step and turn. And I think that um, doubting yourself probably led, led you to put in more effort and make sure the, the standard of your documents were higher. Um, and I think that's a key takeaway from my VCDX journey as well is I wasn't sure what was required. So I just went one level higher than I thought was required. And then I would reread it and I would go, uh, maybe I want to make it a little bit better. And it just keeps raising your bar. So it, it's just a challenge to make yourself better and make your document set better. Um, and now I, I find doing architecture reasonably easy, actually. I, I don't find it terribly challenging because it's not an emotional thing. It's not a stress situation. It's simply I'm following a methodology that I know works really well, making decisions, challenging those with myself, and then coming out with something that, again, I'm not emotionally connected to. If I give you a design and you say, Josh, this is terrible, you've, you've forgotten three things, I'll be like, oh, thank you. That's great. Let me fix that. Like, it, it Yeah, you're not cool. insulted. Yeah. You're, you're happy we caught that before it, before it went out. Mm. So I think that's a really important takeaway, but sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to highlight oh, no. that point because I think it's, it's so important. It's huge. Um, but so, yeah, I was struggling and going through that. And for me, this is the first time I had written a document of this size and scope. I mean, before that, uh, Microsoft Word, well, you know, you write a letter and off it goes. Hmm. Uh, so uh, that brings up a good point. Take an advanced course in Word and learn how to use Word and captions and figures and tables and build tables of contents and use styles to make your documentation life much easier. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you'll start to appreciate it as you go through it. There's enough free tutorials and whatnot, but I think that will make your life a lot easier, especially when you're dealing with a document greater than four pages. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great. Anyway. Yeah. So uh, doing those, doing the actual defense, it was hysterical. Uh, it was the week of VMworld uh, 2009 in San Francisco. Uh, and on, uh, yeah, it was Thursday was going to be my testing day. Mm -hmm. So I set up the VCP exam in the morning, and then I had an afternoon VCDX defense. And at the time, it was a three-hour session. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went in and I sat my VCP4 exam ba back then, and I failed. I failed bad. <laughs> uh, 
And, you know, it had been out for like six months. I, I had written my VCDX against the v vSphere 4 content mm. uh, because I asked specifically and I was allowed to do that. Uh, so I was really surprised that I failed and it didn't really lead me to a lot of hope to pass the VCDX if I can't even pass the most basic VCP exam the same day. Mm. Uh, but I did. I sat down. I did the exam. Uh, just like your experience, right? It took, uh, you know, months to get to this look to this point, right? I'm sitting there and I go and I do my defense. I was actually really petrified. Um, but once I figured out they were just smart customers asking me smart questions in a, uh, you know, presentation meeting, it just felt like work to me. So I went right into work mode. I was completely relaxed after a couple of seconds, drawing on a whiteboard, having a good old time. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think the advantage every candidate that goes through it now, usually you get an answer back the next week uh, that you've passed or failed uh, the defense. Back then, it was months, and I had to keep emailing the certification team mm. because there was no process, right? Technically, there's still no uh, certification tracker for VCDX when you talk about partners and their levels with VMware. VCDX isn't even an option anywhere on there. Mm. Uh, so... Yeah, I can see how that could have, you know, slipped. But waiting four or five months to find out that you passed or not was absolute misery. Yeah, I can uh, imagine. Two weeks for me was misery. So I can't imagine waiting longer, especially after all that effort and time. And, you know, you, you kind of want to know. And even if it's not the result you want, you, you just want to know. Um, but I will tell you, the customer design that I used, when I actually handed it to them, I was so confident that I have everything articulated because – it was a real customer. It was a real project. They mm -hmm. wanted to do things um, that were new and shiny and attractive uh, from that perspective, right? Uh, and I kind of steered them back because I'm like, just because it's cool doesn't mean we should implement it, mm. right? Just because it's a brand new thing. What value is it bringing to the objectives that you laid out? And I was able to have that conversation immediately, even before I found out whether I passed or failed because I produced mm -hmm. all this content and thought through everything that I was you know, going to present as an architected design that the customer was going to go ahead and follow. Um, so I saw immediate results from it just because I had to do something like create the paperwork for the project that I was working on. Uh, and I, you said you were working on the project for yours, right? Yeah, I had the exact same experience. I just thought, wow, I'm working on this project. It was perfect timing. And I'm just like, cool, I'm going to make sure this is, you know, goes well beyond what I would normally do. And yeah, that's fantastic. So, yeah, you might have a certain amount of hours to do the, the design. Um, and I just put in extra effort out of hours and, you know, working with James and it was fantastic. So it just made it so much easier when I'm presenting that back internally. I was working for IBM at the time. Um, so when I was presenting these things to the IBM team, everyone's like, oh, wow, you've got a lot of detail here. I'm like, well, yeah. And I wasn't telling everyone else I was using it for VCDX. It was just well, I'm trying to do my best here. And uh, yeah, it was definitely well received and very easy to present back. So as far as, you know, what's the benefit of the VCDX program, even if no one knows what it means, you become so much better as an architect, so much more confident in your abilities. And, you know, when you present back, you know what you're talking about. Um, so it's... it's I'll add one more thing. You know, some people perceive it as a boys club. Well, that's been shattered, right? There's there's so many women in the in the VCDX club now mm. uh, that's shattered. But you know, the thing that you know, the gist that it made was that it was a group of people that would help each other out at any point in time. Mm. I mean, in social media, uh, whether you're a Facebook user, Twitter, or Mastodon, take your pick. It doesn't matter, right? If you reach out to the community at large and say, "Hey, VCDX, uh, I'm doing X, Y, and Z," can you know? I'm weak. Can you point me in the right direction? It's amazing how the mm -hmm. community, you know, only 300 strong, everyone has an area of expertise. And being able to ask and get an answer from a community across the globe, mm -hmm. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, and it's it's a benefit that, you know, isn't even tangible. I mean, how, how do you get access to that kind of brain power? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we talked about this word already, Josh, trust, right? If you get you know, any of the VCDXs that are out there, you know, once you know what it takes to get there, if they if they tell you something, you're pretty confident that uh, they're they're leading you to right, down the right path. Yeah, because they understand how to say, 
I don't know. Let me find out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I yeah. don't know is not yeah. a scary word in IT. Uh, not, not for me at all. I say it all the time. Um, and every time I say it, I learn something. So to me, it's, it's almost a good thing. I, I want to be in a meeting where I don't know something so I can find out. But you actually reminded me of a of a um, of an episode of I can't remember what it was called, but Craig Waters um, used to be at Nutanix. Um, I think he's with Pure Storage now. Maybe haven't seen you for a long time, Craig. Hope you're well. But he interviewed me when I was at IBM, and the interview was basically about you know what's the value of contributing to the V community. You know you don't get paid for it. You, you know, there's very little recognition and blah blah blah. And I said, well, it, it's really about developing your career. It's, you know, making sure you're developing content, which is of a high quality, because you're not going to present something in public, which is crap, right? You'll look like an idiot. So you create some good content, you present it, which helps you create content, practice your communication skills, presentation skills. And then as a result of that, you start networking with people. So there's all these benefits of contributing and donating some time that the comment I, I said to Craig, and I'll, I'll find the video and, and I'll share it, but it was something along the lines of, um, I think to be successful in, especially at an expert level, you have to do that. It's not like it's optional and it's a nice thing to do. You'll fall behind uh, if you don't do those things uh, because working in isolation, you don't get that broad experience. Like you and I would never have met if I just, you know, kept in my little bubble and, you know, um, and never contributed anything to the community, we would have never met, we'd never have built a friendship and trust and all that stuff that is now benefiting both our companies and our customers. So yeah, absolutely communicate or contributing to the V community has been an enormous value for me. Um, and I plan to keep doing that um, indefinitely. So do I, I've gotten a lot of, lot of help out there. Uh, there was a gentleman named Chris Harney uh, that uh, used to run uh, the V mug in Boston, uh, well, New England, sorry. And, uh, he gave me some really good advice about, you know, presenting, right? Uh, so presenting never came easy for me. Uh, and finding a topic was even more difficult, right? For the V community. Cause I'm like, Oh, shiny new, really complicated thing. He's like, you know what? Just when you're contributing it, start out with the basics. Mm. You'll be amazed at how much you think is basic knowledge that people aren't even aware of. Mm. And uh, he got me on a really good track because if you have those basic presentations and you get up there and you put yourself out and you're sharing with the community, the people that want to know more, they'll drag you off to the side and they'll, they'll mm. really have those conversations. And uh, that was something I never learned uh, early on in my career. So back, what was it, 2003, 2004, VMware was having their first VMworld. Uh, I was still an engineer at heart back then, just the speeds and feeds and, you know, leave me in the server room kind of guy. Um, and they, my company said, you want to go to this conference? I was like, eh, no, I already know everything. And I wrote the book on it. Um, and I was, no one had made me aware of what the community meant. Hmm. And my boss took me under his wing after that comment. And he showed me, and he forced me to do presentations. He showed me the value of user groups. He made me go and do presentations for all these groups. Mm. So I was honestly pushed, shoved and forced into becoming a active participant in a community. Um, I'm going to you that's and I was, so I, kudos yeah. to, uh, to that person who pushed you to do it because so, uh, yeah. yeah, Dave Martell, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And kudos. I always give them to you. You deserve it. Yeah. I mean, what better uh, endorsement of the V community than that? Uh, I think, you know, we've both benefited so much from it that, uh, yeah, I certainly encourage my team if, if they want to present something or go to an event or whatever, you know, go right ahead. Um, you know, Melissa Palmer just went out to VM Explore with me and, you know, did a bunch of interviews and talked to a bunch of people and, you know, it's hugely valuable um, for us as individuals to the company and also to the community. So, yeah. And didn't she end up, all right, so two things about that trip Melissa took. One, she had what two days' notice to go, right? Something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, then on I top of that, I it like yeah, two days before or something. So uh, yeah. And on top of that, I saw her at one of the community theater stages, giving her, you know, giving a presentation in front of a, you know, couple mm -hmm. hundred people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's another thing that you know, uh, the VCDX skill set and uh, going through that program, 
There's no fear in her about jumping up in front of a audience and talking about a topic that she had maybe a day to prep <laughs> uh, for for that that level of presentation. But oh, it's kind of expensive. And, and she's actually, we've got a podcast episode coming out uh, very soon, or it'll be out by the time this is released, but um, hour and a half talking about ransomware. And I'm just sitting back going, oh, I've learned some stuff on this. This is good. You know, <laughs> I won't hint too much that uh, I'm so dumb I didn't know half that stuff. But, you know, it was just listening to her speak, um, you know, on ransomware and all the different things she does, you know, it's fantastic. So huge learning experience. Um, yeah, with with basically no preparation as well. So, uh, yeah, very lucky to have her in the team. Awesome. Well, well Josh, I think we've we're running, I'm running your clock up here. I hope we're you... doing well. Oh, you got anything else? Let's do we want to touch on anything else? I thought I heard you run through a list. Uh, I think yeah, we did everything. We did. We actually nailed the list. I, I think it's, it's been a very easy conversation uh, as it always is with, uh, with good friends. Um, so, Look, if there's anything else you want to talk about, I, I'll sit here all day talking to smart people. I always learn something. But, uh, yeah, I really well, you know what? Time. We'll do another episode at some point, right? Uh, 45 minutes if we break this up into two sessions, mm. a two-parter. That's going to give people a lot to, to chew on, right? Uh, let's come back and let's get back together and uh, and we'll we'll rehash some topics. Let's, uh, let's figure out what we're doing moving forward. And, mm. hey, if uh, anybody out there has things that they want to hear talked about, I suggest I suggest filling Josh's inbox with spam and yeah, suggestions. Spam me for sure. I'll uh, I'll definitely get some smart guests on and uh, and we'll hear from them and I'll just sit here and, and learn with the rest of us. But uh, yeah, I think maybe we could do a uh, an episode on a on a partner to partner piece of work and a case study that we've done together. Um, I think that'd be a really fun one to do. Uh, if it has to be anonymized, so be it. But I think that would be a cool episode of talking about how we've partnered, what we delivered where the value was and, you know, and just showing that it, it does work and it's uh, it's a valuable thing to do and build trust with, with other partners. It's, uh, it's worth it for everyone. Yes, it is. And it might be a difficult thing to do, but if it's, if it's difficult for you the first time, it will become easier. Mm -hmm. Just got to find people that you can trust. Exactly. And, uh, that makes it so much easier. Indeed. So well, looking forward to it, Josh, and uh, we'll catch up soon. Thanks very much. Enjoy your evening. Everyone out there, have a good night. <laughs> See you later.